Right, so there has been a whole load of new hot hatches setting outrageous times at the Nürburgring. And by that I mean way faster than some of the supercars that used to be top of the rankings. Look, this Audi RS3 is faster around the lap than a Pagani Zonda S. The Honda Civic Type R is faster than a Nissan GTR and this Megan RS Trophy R is the quickest of the lot faster than your everyday supercar you used to stick on your wall. Yep, Bugattis, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, the lot. Even faster than the holder of the Moose Test record, the mighty Citroen Xantia. And whilst it's obvious that new cars are faster than old ones, these are hatchbacks family cars. They have no reasonable right to be beating the Ferraris and Lamborghinis of just 10 years ago. So let me tell you about the key engineering breakthroughs that made them so fast. This is The Evolution, the series where we use cars from throughout the years to show you just how much things have changed. So it all started with the Mark 1 Golf GTI. Well, not really. Despite this being credited as the first hot hatch, it wasn't. It was just the first one to make it big. I mean, if you rule out that the Jaguar E-Type technically had a hatch, most people agree the first hot hatch was the 1971 BMW 2000 Ti Touring. This thing was pretty cool. It had a two litre engine and rear wheel drive, but it had 138 horsepower, which was a lot at the time, considering that the E-Type had 265. So this had impressive punch and was very light at just over 1000 kilograms. It was fast, nimble, and a lot of fun. Then the next significant car was the Mark 1 Golf GTI and this one made it big, a real classic now. This only came out five years later in 1976, but it was a much more modern take on what a fast hatchback should be. It was front engined, front wheel drive with plenty of power, a format that has stuck until today. Whilst it only made 110 horsepower, it weighed 810 kilograms. That is nothing compared to the cars of today. And this was the key here. Powering the front wheels did come with some handling compromises, but it made the car lighter, more agile, and more importantly, cheaper. And yes, it did have a slight tendency to understeer, but it had a lot of liftoff oversteer, which is something you tune into front wheel drive race cars where the rear can slide under braking or lift off. This rotates the car mid corner, allowing you to get the power down again. This is a lot of fun. The whole car was made to be simple in order to keep the price down. And unsurprisingly, the demand for it was enormous. A reasonably priced, fun, fast hatchback. Sign me up right now. Now, in the 80s, in order to keep making faster and faster hatchbacks, manufacturers essentially started mirroring the supercars of the time. The Renault 5 Turbo was a great example of that. They aimed to get around the typical front wheel drive understeer by ditching the cramped rear seats and filling the space with the 1.4 litre engine which then powered the rear wheels. Renault essentially made a mid-engined rear wheel drive hatchback and it was incredibly cool. And this really cool trend stuck around. Peugeot wanted to get into rallying, Group B more specifically, all to topple the legendary Audi Quattro. And they found that this hatchback short wheelbase design made the car balanced and very good in the corners. Then combine this with the better weight distribution that comes with the mid engine layout and this thing was incredible. But the issue here is that both of these cars were limited run and very, very expensive when compared to the Golf. The Mark II and III Golfs were nowhere near as successful as the Mark I. They gained far more fat than muscle and didn't have the agile, precise feel that the Mark I had. And that was when they realized what they did right with the Mark I. It's not the power that matters, it's the power to weight. And having more weight means you need more power and therefore the thing just costs more. And so step in the Japanese with the Civic Type R in 1997. They made the car light, gave it a ton of power and fitted properly sorted steering. But what they did best of all was change how the power was delivered. Rather than adding turbos, they fitted the mighty VTEC system. And as every Type R owner will tell you, in 
endless detail, the system changes the valve timing at higher revs for more power. But on top of this, it revved up to 9,000 RPM. That's Porsche territory. And this made it a joy to drive, delivering the power way up in the rev range, making the car feel even faster than it was. Then for good measure, they stripped out the majority of the sound deadening. Yes, to save weight, but mostly so you could hear the engine better. And that's what I love about race cars, where you can just feel the engine. Then in 2002, the Ford RS came along. This was the result of Ford's rally team stripping a focus down and ditching 70% of it. Probably don't need those things anyway. It had a supercharged two litre engine that produced 215 horsepower. Now it was around this point where just bolting on more power started to become an issue. When you try and take more than about 200 horsepower and put it through a front differential and to the front tires, you get something called torque steer. Now this is because of the way a front engine gearbox and differential are designed. Manufacturers have to fit the whole thing under the engine, all in a very cramped engine bay. So these gearboxes normally have two drive shafts each of different lengths. Now this means that the shorter drive shaft applies marginally more power, which turns the steering. You can really feel it when driving these cars and it can affect handling. So what Ford did was fit a limited slip differential. This applied the power more evenly, improving the torque steer problem and also giving it more traction out of the corners. Very clever Ford. And this type of system wasn't normally fitted to a front wheel drive road car. It essentially used viscous fluid to lock up when one wheel was spinning. With the axle essentially locked, this applies the driving force to the wheel with the most grip and drives you out of the corner. Around the same time though, VW released the Golf R32. Now this was the first hot hatch to bring in a dual clutch transmission shortening the time off power during gear changes and therefore was much quicker in a straight line. But that wasn't too much of a concern with 243 horsepower coming from a 3.2 litre V6. On top of that, it had an immensely clever all wheel drive system and ESP that could break individual wheels. That was quite advanced for the time. Moving forward to 2009, where Ford took the hot hatch horsepower numbers in the 200s up to 300. And whilst Ford realized that sending all of that power to the front wheels could be unwise, they did it anyway, as the recent financial crash meant that the additional cost of a four wheel drive system wouldn't have paid off. So instead, they found another route around the torque steer issue. They came up with the Revo Knuckle system, an elaborate but kind of genius solution to the problem. So Ford added in this C-section piece that essentially separated the steering axis from the suspension system. Now this works by a lever effect. So shortening this lever meant that there was less force put into the steering system, essentially halving the torque steer. Now you could say that this is only patching the issue, so you don't feel the torque steer but people said it made all the difference. And it was confirmed by both Renault and Honda who soon copied it. Now into the last 10 years, the majority of the properly powerful hot hatches have all been four wheel drive. The Focus RS, the Golf R, the Audi RS3, and the Mercedes A45 all use this sort of system, and they are mighty fast because of it. But what's more interesting are the ones that don't. The Golf GTI Club Sport S and the new Civic Type R both stick to front wheel drive and manage to keep up. Well, for the Golf, VW came up with a new take on the limited slip differential we spoke about earlier. They call it the VAQ system. Short for this word, I'm not even gonna bother attempt saying. Vorda Ach Square. It's an electronically controlled front axle transverse differential lock system. Try saying that quickly. Anyway, it's actually separate from the diff and it uses a Heldex style clutch on either side of the diff. This allows the system to engage or disengage the power from either front wheel. Really, it's a bit like the all wheel drive systems on rally cars, allowing them to send more or less power to the front or rear of the car. Only in this case, it's to the left or right driving wheel. That is clever. I mean, that, that is really clever. This allows them to power one wheel much more than the other. So in corners, it can completely negate understeer, actually pulling the car towards the apex of the corner. But it's the Renault Megane 
RS trophy, which holds the current record, which surprisingly does have power numbers that are in the 300s. They decided to settle for less power because it allowed them to keep the weight down. They took 140 kilograms out of the regular RS. They also stiffened up the chassis and vastly improved the suspension system and it all clearly paid off. And we'll get to the outrageous lap it did in a second. So we've gone over all of the very clever mechanical systems that allow these hatches to get quicker and quicker, but there's been a silent step-by-step -step improvement over that time. And it's the tires, the only contact that the car has with the track. The amount of additional grip these cars have is incredible. It would be night and day if you put one of these cars on 10 year old tires and had a race. Adding a tiny amount of grip can take seconds off a lap time and that's because it compounds. With more grip you can brake later, carry more speed through the corner and accelerate harder out of that turn. Then with that additional speed you gain time all the way up to the next braking phase. To prove my point, let me show you some Nordschleifer times. For reference, a GT3 race car does the lap in about six and a half minutes, whereas my lovely Passat, the GT model no less, would do it in about 10 minutes. Look at this. Here are the current top times from hot hatches. The Megane holds the front wheel drive record currently, and that matches the Bugatti Veyron, the Lamborghini Murcielago, and the Mercedes SLS AMG. Then the Civic Type R beats the 2010 Nissan GTR and the Pagani Zonda S. Do you get my point? The handling, power delivery, and shorter shift times mean these hot hatches are outrageously fast, quicker than the poster cars from just 10 years ago. But really, a lot of that time comes down to the tires. Additional grip is the superpower here. The compounds have improved massively. They stay in the right temperature window for longer and massively help performance. Anyway, if anyone has a Zonda they wouldn't mind taking to the Nürburgring for us, it would be interesting to see what it could do on some up-to-date rubber. Thanks very much for watching. Check out these other videos which we think you'll love and I'll see you in the next one.